So welcome everybody. I know that we still have some other people who will probably join us in the next little bit, but um, we have a lot of information to cover today. We have three topics and they are all really important topics. So I want to dive right in. First of all, I'd like to um, wish everyone a very happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, you know, we are not all drinking green beer. Um, so <laughs> if you go to the next slide, you'll be able to see my funny St. Patrick's Day picture. So happy St. Patrick's Day and um, hope everybody is having, having a good day so far. Um, and our agenda for tonight, so we have our first speaker is going to be talking about everything you need to know about pumping. So we have that and then preparing your body for birthing position. So we have a special guest joining us today to talk about that. And then we're going to be talking about the postpartum roller coaster of emotions. And so that uh, is going to be our, our, um, our last speaker for today. We'll have a question and answer period. So if you want to ask questions throughout the presentations, please feel free to put your questions in the chat box. So for right now, so everybody can get used to where the chat box is. If you are joining us for the workshop, would you please put your name and where, um, when you're due, if you're expecting or how old your baby is, if your baby is already here and also um, what you're hoping to learn tonight. So put that in the chat in the chat and then if you have any questions throughout please feel free to put them in the chat and then we will answer them through the Q&A portion and then we do invite you to please stay after we're going to go into breakout rooms where you will be able to ask um, questions for the the team members but also to get to know us a little bit better and for us to get to know you as well. So first I would like to introduce Christiane. Christiane is a birth and postpartum doula with us at Helping Hands. Her friends like to affectionately call her the baby whisperer. That's probably why our clients um, love her so much. And she loves to travel. And I'm interested to hear Christiane where you would love to travel next um, if you could go anywhere. And her favorite quote is, you are either succeeding or learning. And that is definitely true. So Christiane, you can take it away, but first tell us where you wanna travel. Hey everyone, I'm Christiane. Thank you for that, Christy, my fellow Christy. Um, you know, honestly, I'd love to go to Bora Bora, but that's like maybe a retirement place. Um, but definitely, I think that my next trip in right now, somewhere hot and sunny, that's all I wish for right now for us in COVID. I wish everyone to go on a hot vacation. <laughs> so hopefully that'll happen soon. So for me, what we're going to do is talk about a couple of different things. And first, we're going to we're going to um, start with different types of breast milk expression. So you might have heard or not about hand express, expressing, hand expression, excuse me. Um, so the reasons to hand express actually are to drain the breast or help relieve blocked ducts, help engorged breasts, help let down. And they can be, it can be done before or after pumping as well. Doesn't have to be, but it can be. And it's really useful for um, the chest feeding parent or the pumping um, parent to use this expression when they might be away from their baby. So if there's somewhere where there's baby crying or there's places where, you know, your baby isn't around, you need to like do that hand expression to have that relief. So that's one of the 
one of the couple of the reasons why we do the hand expression. So you're welcome to go onto YouTube and um, Google some hand expression videos. There's lots, there's lots of ones out there. Um, you start by just warming your hands. You want to make sure you don't have really cold hands and you just warm them up and you're going to use light, gentle massage, one hand under the other, or you can do the technique that we have posted here. Um, you can do kneading or tap some fingers that will help the letdown. And sometimes it sprays and sometimes it drips. So it just depends on the parent what's, what's gonna happen there. And a lot of times um, what will help is actually rubbing olive oil all around the breast. That will help with the massage techniques as well. And you just want to adjust your fingers um, to the flow. So wherever you feel like the positioning will be correct. If you look at the diagram here, it says place thumb and fingers about one inch beyond behind nipple, excuse me, and then compress hand toward chest and press hand together and forward. So it's actually a really, really easy motion to work through. And I think that hand expression um, is really something that a lot of a lot of parents do as well. So um, there's a couple of different ways that we can collect the milk. Um, there's different things and I'm going to move on to the next slide and show you and also show it here as well. This is a haka, okay? So there's different ways that you can use the haka. Um, just, it uses actually a vacuum seal. So you push it in and then you place on breast. And then when you let go, the vacuum slow, very, very, very slowly um, starts suctioning. And what it does is it collects the breast milk, okay? So a lot of times um, chest feeding parent will, you know, put it on one side when they're feeding baby on the other, or if they have a single pump, one-sided pump, they might put it on the other. Um, this is a really great way to collect collect breast milk. And a lot of times you just take what's in here and it goes into the bottle and it goes either, you know, you keep it at room temperature or goes in fridge or goes to the freezer. So I like, really like that one. Also a good way too is as well is the medicine cup. So we take breast and as we're doing the squeezing motion, we actually can collect the breast milk this way too. So as we're expressing, the breast milk can go into the medicine cup as well, okay? And then another way as well as we have is the syringe. So we can collect the breast milk too by syringe, okay? And depending, also this is really great for colostrum too as well. The breast milk that comes before your full breast milk comes in, the nutrients, we wanna collect that and hopefully give to baby. And this is a really great way, okay? So those are some couple of ways that we can do to collect the breast milk that we either hand express um, or there's just a lot of letdown and you have some overflow that you don't want to um, push by the wayside. Um, another one here is breast shells. And they actually, you can put them in your bra if you want some, you know, just tuck it in there and you find that you might be leaking or you have um, a lot of overflow. So those shells will actually collect um, the expressed milk and it also keeps your nipples from chafing. And like I said, collects the extra breast milk. So that's a really great way as well to collect um, any, any over, over let down. And different types of pumps. Here we go. This is, a, there's a lot of information around pumps. Um, so there's the two basic different kinds. One is the manual, which we can see here. So that's actually a lot of gripping motion that we use for the manual pumps. Some people like the manual pumps for quick, like in the car, if you need some relief or you, stick, you know, tuck it in your diaper bag when you're going somewhere. Um, a lot of people just like these for the quick grab, okay? When we're at home, a lot of chest feeding parents like the electric. So there is tons of different electric pumps out there. 
you can see actually there's one in the picture that I have right here, okay? So, and they vary all different prices. So the Medela is a really, really popular brand and you'll see a couple different Medellas here. And you can get ones that um, the actual unit is contained in a backpack, okay? There's the other one that I shown, showed you above and that one is actually called the Medela Swing Electric and it ranges about $169, $170, okay? Then there's the Medela Pump and Style, which is a closed system, which is actually the one in the middle at the top. Um, yep, that's it there. Um, and that is a flex. So it actually, this part of the pump actually flex back and forth to get a different positioning um, for breast, okay? And then there's the number one top of the line that they have now. Sorry, that one just to, just to step back is about 239, okay? Then there's the Medela top of the line one that has the app that goes to your phone. It's wireless, Bluetooth communication. Um, and that one ranges at about 399. So that's the higher end of the pumps. Now, if we go over to the Advent one over here, which I really like as well, um, it does the trick, it's closed system. And um, that one is a really great price of about 139, 139 to 169 I saw. Um, and that one does the trick too. But I know that Medela is the, the more popular brand at the moment. Um, and when it comes to breast, breast pumps, you know, honestly, if you have insurance, a lot of insurance companies actually cover your uh, pricing for a breast pump. So if you give your insurance company a call, that would be a really great question to ask them. I know a lot of places do up to four to 500 too as well for a breast pump. Um, so I think that would be a really great thing. If you can get it covered, then that would be even more wonderful, right? Um, it is up to you whether or not you want to do an electric pump or not. Some people get it beforehand and some people wait and get it after or some people um, are strictly chest feeding, which is always the goal, but because there's some challenges from time to time, um, a pump can actually really come in handy. So if we have any other questions about pumps, I would love to answer them. So stick around and yeah. I'll uh, let you know any suggestions or anything that I have, the information that I can offer. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christiane. There is so much to know when it comes to pumps, and it really depends on the situation and what works best for different people. So, um, you know, it's... Uh, not an exact science, unfortunately, but um, we love to be able to share information to our clients about that. So I would love to introduce Brianna St uh, Stuthiel. How do you pronounce that properly, Brianna? Actually, Stuthite. So there should be a T at the end, but that's all good. <laughs> oh, well, that's probably why it doesn't... Uh... Sounds good at Stuthiel. <laughs> All right. Um, so she is a special guest joining us today. Uh, she has been teaching yoga since 2014. So basically when she was three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just joking. A funny thing about her is she loves to collect teapots, preferably in the shape of a giraffe, which I think is pretty, pretty fun. And um, I believe there is a quote. Nope. No quote. No quote. Um, so Brianna, you're going to talk to us about preparing your body for birthing positions. Yeah, I'm so excited. We can, uh, we can pull up the, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about uh, stretching tonight, building some awareness, some pelvic floor breathing, and then some uh, strengthening and lengthening different areas. So primarily when we get to the strengthening and lengthening, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about um, the position of like a hands and knees position or perhaps like knees on the ground and you're using something or perhaps someone as support in, in the birthing position and how we can prepare for that specifically. So starting with stretching and how do you know if you're stretching safely and, and whatnot? So, 
The first point, the, the range that we want to think about is 40%. 40 to 60%, the earlier you are in your pregnancy, the more likely you are to hang out in that 60% range. The closer you are to your due date, the, the more you want to hang out in that 40% range. And that's due to a, um, a hormone in the body called relaxin. And so relaxin is so important, so helpful to get our you know, pelvic region ready for birth and be able to have the mobility in that area. So it allows our muscles to uh, stretch a little further and do, as it says, relax. To, to allow for birth. And the interesting thing about relaxin is that we don't totally know how much is in your body. And for yeah. every woman, you start to produce it at a different point in your pregnancy. You definitely have it at the end of your pregnancy, but depending on when you start producing it, um, is, is very individual and very pregnancy dependent. So it can be different from um, pregnancy to pregnancy. So it's a really nice, safe way to, to say, stay in 40 to 60%. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, great, but how do I know what that is? And so if you'd like to try with me a little, a little stretch just with our hands so that we can experience and start to think about what that might feel like for ourselves and our bodies. So you can bring your, your non-dominant hand in front of you. And I have my fingers flexed and you can join me with this or if you wanna just watch, that's fine. And the first thing that we're gonna experience or uh, play with is to bring our right hand against our left and pull it as far back as you can go. And for me right away, that, that's 100% a sensation. And that's going to feel like you can, you can let it go. But for me, in my body, that feels like, oh, there's, there's a subtle strain in my shoulders, my neck. I'm having difficulties talking and breathing. And that's a signal when you're having a difficulties um, breathing or there's excess tension in the body that you're going a little too far. Now, if you just bring your hand lightly against, it's like, you know, five, five percent, you're just holding it in place. And so let's experience or let's try out bringing it back nice and slow until the point that you start to feel a little gentle stretch. You may choose to go a little bit further there, but just notice the experience in your body. Notice the sensation in your shoulders and your breath. So this is about what 40 to 60% feels like. And that's gonna feel slightly different in different parts of your body, but it's a good place to, to begin to understand. Now, our next point here is to build awareness. And so we're really building internal awareness of the sensations that are happening in your body. And this is so, so helpful throughout your pregnancy, through the birthing process, and through life onwards afterwards. And so a couple of reasons why this is helpful, <clears throat> thinking about the birthing uh, process in particular, um, if you have some internal awareness, you may have a moment in between contractions where you can think, oh my gosh, what do I need right now? And having that awareness allows you to be able to communicate that outwards. So you can share this with your doula, share this with your partner of like, oh my gosh, my low back is killing me. I need some support here on my sacrum. And they can come and support you with your ability to know, okay, what am I feeling? How can I communicate this outwards? It is also extremely helpful afterwards when we're thinking about pelvic floors and pelvic breathing and um, working with that region um, postpartum. All right, so that is my soapbox on uh, building awareness. So next we can try it out. I recommend that you come to a comfortable seat wherever you are, I imagine that you're sitting. So that might look like your feet flat on the floor, maybe your sit bones, those bones in your, in your bum are just on the edge of your seat, guiding the shoulders back over your hips. And now for me and my experience, I find it really uh, supportive to close my eyes, I find it easier to tune into my senses. So just check in, what can you feel right now? Perhaps you can feel the texture of your clothing, maybe your temperature. Perhaps there are some areas of your body that are warmer or cooler than others. Are there any areas that feel relaxed? Are there any areas that feel mm, like the sensation is calling for your attention? Perhaps that can be an ache or any other form. 
those are some questions you can ask yourself to build internal body awareness. And checking in with yourself on a daily basis, just for a minute or two, can help you build this, this internal awareness. You can always use the five senses as a guide. What can I taste? Leftover, maybe some dinner leftover. What can I smell? What do I hear? And lastly, what do I feel inside? Taking another moment or two to wrap up, noticing your senses. You're welcome to open your eyes. If you're enjoying this trying things out thing, then stay where you are because we're gonna move into pelvic breathing. So pelvic breathing is so important. And when you um, deliver your baby and if you choose to keep your baby, you may notice their breathing. So you may notice how their little bellies expand. And as we go throughout life and we go throughout the world and we have different stresses and we grow up and we become adults, our breathing changes due to the way that we interact with the world and some of our experiences. So pelvic breathing is really helping us go back to our natural breath. We can be really supportive afterwards for rebuilding some of that pelvic floor and knitting those muscles back together, as well as preparing for birth, learning to relax that region in that area. So we'll begin by just some you know, education of the, the pelvic floor and the abdomen. So if you think of your torso and your abdomen as a little container, we have the little lid is our diaphragm and the bottom is our pelvic floor. We've got all of these internal organs in here. And what's so cool about our body is that we can, you know, squish and twist and move and things adjust. So as your lungs fill up with air, they're expanding and this presses the diaphragm downwards. And that's why the belly expands with our breath. And as our belly expands, our lungs expand, the diaphragm is pressing down. And so does the pelvic floor, it relaxes down. And as we breathe out, the lungs contract and start to empty out and our everything on the inside starts to pull up. So checking in with this awareness, Let's just begin with some belly breaths. So perhaps encouraging the breath into your body and expanding the belly. I find it really helpful to bring my hands onto my body and really feel this. So taking another breath or two like so, noticing that expansion. Now, if you're comfortable, um, I only see the slides and Christy, <laughs> so you can turn your camera off if it's not already off or you can try this another time in your home. It's really helpful to have feedback. You know, pelvic floor breathing is really hard to notice or have awareness of that region. It's not something we do on every day. It's really easy to feel things through our hands because we touch things and move with them. They're, they're our primary tool, but our pelvic floor, not so much. So it's really normal to, have limited awareness for it. Um, me personally, I think it took like three weeks of a daily practice to be like, oh, that's my pelvic floor. There it is. So it can be helpful to, to actually give some, some external feedback, whether that's bringing your hands to the region and, and holding and just experiencing your breath, breathing into the belly and noticing this relaxation, this, this uh, expansion and focusing on relaxing the pelvic floor. Or if you have a pillow, you can always come to a seated position, uh, kneeling with the pillows underneath of you and feeling the pressure of the pelvic floor pressing into the pillow can be really helpful. So we'll just take two, two more breaths together to do some pelvic floor breathing, whether you wanna grab a prop or bring your hand to that region. Let's take a breath in together. Noticing and expanding the belly and the pelvic floor. And as you breathe out, you may notice a coming inwards of the belly, the chest, and the pelvic floor. One more, breath in. And breath out. Nice. You can open your eyes and adjust your posture. Now I'm going to try to move through our strengthening and like singing in a timely fashion, um, but I'm actually gonna stand up here and move my chair sideways so that I can demo these positions as we talk about them. 
So let's think about um, strengthening. You can just let me know, Christy, if the thumbs up, if you can see me okay, since I can't see myself, okay. So thinking about strengthening, if you are in a birthing position that is somewhat either on your hands and knees on the ground or hands and knees with some sort of furniture support in any way, shape or form, it's gonna look a lot of different ways if you go through this, it's gonna have many different variations. Then we are really thinking about what is supporting us. And that is our upper body and the natural weight of our hips going down into our knees is going to be our biggest support but thinking about our upper body doesn't have that you know natural downward support and so we're really strengthening our back and this mobility in our shoulders okay so you're welcome to get up and do this with me I'm just going to do one or two renditions of each movement an idea of the first is coming into a position here with your arms extended now you may not exactly burst with your arms extended, but we're gonna find our um, support and our strengthening. First, beginning by extending the shoulder blades, really pushing your hands away from you, and then draw the shoulder blades down your back. This is helpful for us to just build that awareness of where our shoulder blades are so that they're in the proper position when we strengthen. So drawing the shoulder blades back, and this is especially important if you've ever had a shoulder injury. And from here, we can just play with pressing our hands into the chair. You can also do this as a countertop or a couch, and that's gonna bring your shoulders up. Start to relax the heart, the chest downwards, and press the chair away. Okay. Now my knees are nice and wide, and yours likely will be too, to make space for your belly. Now, the next strengthening movement we're gonna do is for our recti spinae muscles. Those are those long muscles along your back. And I say muscles because erecti spinae is a muscle group. And this is really helpful for supporting your body. So next we're gonna bring one leg to the center so that we can extend the other leg behind you. And for me, that is my right leg at the moment. And here we're just gonna press firmly down through our right hand so that we can somewhat make the left hand light. An easy way to think about this to remember is opposite arm, opposite leg. Okay, so you would hold this for a few breaths or a few minutes. No need to lift the hand off of the chair, but just to create a lightness. Now, the last thing I'm gonna encourage you to do that is so important in any birthing position to prepare you for any possible way you might wanna move is mobility in our low back and pelvic region. And this is ultra simple. You can do this seated. You can do this in this hands and knees position where we begin to tuck our tailbone underneath of us and then really lean into those knees and extend the tailbone really high. So when you first start doing this, the range of motion might be you know, small and that's okay. But doing this for you know, a couple minutes every single day is gonna help you increase that range of motion. Now, depending on your birthing position, you, you may need to be able to pelvic tilt in different directions. So my friends, that was ultra quick. <laughs> Look forward to talking to anybody that uh, has any questions in the Q&A. Thanks so much. Brianna, your voice is so soothing that I was having trouble staying awake with those big breaths. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is so nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that information. And it is so important to prepare our bodies ahead of time. Um, you know, it's like training for any sort of physical event. We want to give our bodies a little bit of a heads up on what's coming and it can make things so much easier. Um, even in active labor, when you're at home, which is waiting to get to the hospital um, or even at the hospital, like it's important to be able to, to have those, um, that flexibility and that range of motion and options really, like just options for you, for you to stay comfortable. So thank you for sharing all of that. 
And now I'd like to introduce Amanda Kennedy, who is a postpartum doula on our team. She's originally from New Brunswick, so she comes to us from, uh, from over there in Canada. She has three daughters, a puppy, two cats, an albino, leopard, gecko, and a tarantula, which I have already told her, if I ever go to her house, please hide that thing, because I will not be happy. Um, and her favorite quote is, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning how to dance in the rain. I love that, Amanda. Thank you for uh, having that as your favorite quote, because it was uh, a nice reminder today when I was putting these together. So you are going to be sharing emotions after having a baby. So take it away and tell us all the things we need to know. I will do my best. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm chilled out now after Brianna's presentation too. I'm like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> so um, as Christy said, I'm going to be talking to you about postpartum emotions. So first thing I'd like to talk about baby blues and postpartum depression, because I believe it's important to always mention it. But mostly what I'd like to focus on is the unexpected emotions that you may not realize are common with new parents and typically they aren't discussed openly with friends and family. So first the baby blues. Most of you have probably heard the term. It refers to the mood changes, the overwhelming feelings the birthing parent experiences within the first three to five days after birth and it lasts approximately two weeks. We typically associate the baby blues with hormone changes from giving birth along with the typical sleep deprivation and just adjustment to life with the new baby. Some of the symptoms you can expect to experience if you're feeling the baby blues is um, crying for no apparent reason, feeling irritable or oversensitive, feeling a bit anxious, and lots of mood changes. Most importantly, though, you're still going to be able to care for yourself and your baby, and you enjoy being a mother or a parent most of the time. In comparison, when you look at postpartum depression, it differs from the baby blues in timing and severity. So it can happen any time up to a year after the birth of your child and the symptoms are gonna be much more severe. So typically the baby blues don't need any special treatment other than time to adjust and a supportive environment. Conversely, postpartum depression is more persistent and it won't go away on its own. So you will need to reach out to a professional for support typically. Also postpartum depression can affect anyone. It means not only the birthing parent, but also your supporting parents. You can feel sad, worthless, hopeless, guilty, or anxious a lot of the time. You may lose interest in things you used to enjoy doing and withdraw from others. Can also make it quite hard to focus. You can change the way you eat or sleep, which will then cause some physical health problems possibly. You also may not enjoy the baby or even believe you're a bad parent and may have scary thoughts of harming yourself or the baby. So a bit more severe than baby blues, obviously. If you are experiencing any of these symptoms or your partner is, you should make sure to speak with a medical professional. And it's always just a really good idea to keep your doctors well-informed about how you're doing, not only physically as you um, go through the process after birth, but also emotionally. So now on to some of the more unexpected emotions that are listed there. Um, there are some positive emotions that you may surprisingly experience, but they're positive and quite pleasant. So you're not always afraid or ashamed to talk about them. The topics I want to speak on tonight are the ones that are considered a little more negative and we don't generally share them with just anyone out on the street. The main thing to remember with all of them though, is that they're actually quite common amongst most parents and there are ways to cope with them. So the first one is sadness. This emotion typically occurs for the birthing parent and it may feel like you simply just can't stop crying or control the crying. This does not mean you're sad to be a parent. It's normal to cry over things that don't seem to be going well as you're adjusting to them or even to get overly emotional over something that you may deem silly as like your favorite TV series being canceled. As mentioned, this ties back to the baby blues the birthing parent's body is going through a lot of hormonal changes along with lack of sleep and all the newness of a newborn. So really focusing on your self-care, including sleeping when the baby sleeps can help with this quite a bit. 
also just give yourself time. Let your body adjust to the hormones. Next is fear. So becoming a new parent brings a whole set of new fears, even if you weren't typically someone who worried a lot. You may not, you may worry that you won't know what to do with the baby, what to do if you are alone with them, when your partner goes back to work, possibly how much to feed them, if they're getting enough food, how to soothe them, the list goes on. These fears are not unusual between new parents. It's just, they'll be new to you. You're not alone in caring for your baby or the feelings that you're having and reaching out for support from someone who you trust, who's unbiased and non-judgmental will be super invaluable. As you develop more confidence, these fears should lessen. Next is anger. So this emotion may sound controversial because most new parents aren't going to walk around telling everyone how angry they are. <laughs> so, however, when your hormones are out of control and you're sleep deprived and trying to cope, it isn't unusual for you to feel angry. The main thing to remember is that it's just a feeling. Your feelings aren't wrong. What you end up doing with your feelings is what matters. So acknowledge that you may be frustrated when you can't get your baby to stop crying or they won't fall asleep or you're simply not meeting the expectations you had for your own self as a new parent. So confide in your partner, a trusted support person, and always go back to your expectations and reassess them and see if they're reasonable and try to set more reasonable ex expectations for yourself and seek help when you don't feel like you're coping. Next is the jitters. So during the first few weeks after birth, you may find you're easily startled, you're very tense, you might be anxious. This could make sleeping even more difficult if it's not enough already with a newborn, as you might be aware of every single sound and new babies are surprisingly noisy. Don't worry. Even if you're someone who typically wasn't wor is worried, your feelings will subside as you adjust to the new role and the new baby in your life. Next is hypersensitivity. You may find you're more deeply affected emotionally by everyone and everything. Your emotions are on a bit of a roller coaster, as this has been mentioned earlier, and your instinct to nurture is on super high alert. You may find you're taking things more personally than you normally would, or you could be easily offended by someone's offhand comment. They may think it's nothing and you may be very offended by it. Most new parents are often sensitive to what they can perceive as judgment of their parenting abilities. Um, so one really cool thing here though, is for the scientists, our bodies can help with this by producing oxytocin. So when oxytocin enters the bloodstream, we typically associate that with the uterus and how it affects lactation. But also when it's released into certain parts of the brain, it can impact your emotional, cognitive, and social behaviors, and in particular, your bonding behavior. Oxytocin can also contribute to relaxation, trust, and psychological stability, which in turn will reduce your stress responses and anxiety, lessening your hypersensitivity. So our chest feeding parents will produce oxytocin while chest feeding, but supporting parents or birthing parents that aren't chest feeding can also naturally produce oxytocin through skin-to-skin um, -skin contact or what we refer to as kangaroo care. Next is doubt. Many new parents have feelings of doubt surrounding their ability to care for the baby and whether sometimes they should even have had a child. Often we perceive mothering as an instinct. So we expect we're gonna know exactly what to do when our baby arrives. This is not necessarily the case, especially if breastfeeding challenges arise or another challenge you thought you were gonna just naturally do isn't as natural as you thought. Try not to be too hard on yourself. Allow grace for both yourself and your partner. You guys are all just learning and your newborn is learning as well. They're discovering the new world right along with you. And bear in mind that every single newborn is a unique individual. So even if you have other children, each baby is going to present new and unique challenges and opportunities. Uh, lastly, is loneliness or isolation. So prior to your baby being born, most new parents are anxious for the days they're going to spend at home with their new baby. 
However, after the supporting parent returns to work and you're in the trenches of baby care, parents can find the days very lonely and isolating. In particular, now with COVID and not being able to have friends and family around as much as in the past, it can be even more isolating. So even though your new baby can be completely mesmerizing, they're not typically the ideal companion. The reality of the time at home with your baby might be a lot different than what your expectations were. For example, you could have envisioned long afternoon naps and instead your baby is only willing to sleep if you're standing and pacing the house with them. So these feelings of loneliness can be helped by planning possibly some regular phone or video chats with friends or family now that they can't come visit during COVID, but you can still have that interaction. You can hire a doula to allow some time for you to get some rest and some and for emotional support. Confide in your partner and discuss ways that if necessary, maybe some work-life challenges that will allow you to have some more couple time to allow you to combat some of that loneliness. So lastly, now that we know all the difficult things that may be feeling, what can you do? First, and I think most important is talk. Talk, talk, and talk some more. But do it now. Start before your baby arrives. Talk with each other about what your expectations are of yourself, what you think parenting is going to look like, what you expect your partner will be doing, or what you expect extended family members or anyone that's involved in your life, what you think that's going to look like so that everyone's aware of the expectations. And you can talk about it and maybe someone can say, you know, that might be really difficult for you to do. So maybe I can help you out there. After your baby arrives, keep talking. Share with your partner and support people openly and without blame. Everyone is going through a dramatic life change and you may be experiencing the same event, but it's gonna look different for everyone. So know you're in it together and just try to work through it and keep talking. Find non-judgmental, unbiased and trusted support. So you can talk to, look for therapists, a doula, um, very carefully chosen friends and family members. And lastly, one that I really like is positive self-talk. So you may find yourself spiraling into a situation where you're putting yourself down or getting frustrated. Try to turn that around and remember that you're just going through this for the first time and it's brand new. And, and be kind to yourself like you would be your child or your partner or your friends. So next, set realistic, realistic expectations and reassess them when things aren't working for you. So if you thought that you were going to be able to get a hot meal on the table at the end of every day and that's not working, instead of getting frustrated, look for help. Find ways to make that work for you, whether that's ordering food in, having a friend or a family member bring food for you. So as the next one is listed, ask and accept help. So if someone offers to help you, say sure and give them something to do. <laughs> Look for professionals if you think you need professional support. And that can be a therapist, that can be your doctor, that could be a doula. Um, around the house, you could hire someone to help with cleaning or taking your dog for a walk and meals, um, getting someone to bring them in. That could be friends and family members ordering again, like I mentioned. Next, you really need to make sure you're eating well and get outside. So obviously if we're chest feeding, we wanna make sure that we're eating well, but it's also important for everybody to be eating a healthy diet. And that's gonna be the best way to feel good along with getting outside. Notice I didn't say sleep because we're just gonna to try to sleep as much as we can, but we have a newborn. <laughs> um, but getting outside and some vitamin D, some fresh air, a change of scenery can really lift your spirits. Next, do something you love, which could be yoga like we just saw. It's really great for calming us down. Um, anything, keep it small, pick it something simple, pick up a book you love. Um, anything, have a special treat that you used to really enjoy. Just be kind to yourself. Next, bond with your spouse or partner. This can be a big challenge in that now your whole life revolves around a little person and you will have to actually set time aside and find ways to bond with them. And that will really lift your spirits and talk about 
the feelings that you're having and find out what feelings they're having. And lastly is journaling. So write in a journal, put your thoughts out there, let them be out in the world. Sometimes just writing them down is enough to feel better. And it's also a way to look back and see what was I feeling, especially if you do find that you want to seek out professional support, you have a history of something to share, but ultimately journaling is just a really nice way to get your feelings down and out. And I think that covers everything. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. That was really interesting and really important to talk about because, you know, we talk about things like the baby blues and um, the postpartum mood disorders and things like that, but there's a lot of emotions that are very normal and you don't necessarily hear from your friends that, you know, they also felt doubt about their abilities to, um, to be a good parent or, you know, why did I work so hard to get pregnant and have this baby? And now I'm wondering what I was thinking. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, of normal emotions and, uh, you know, that, is really important to understand. So we didn't get any questions in our chat bo uh, box, but if anybody wants to ask us anything, um, you can. And if not, um, so I'll give, you know, one or two seconds for anyone who has a question to unmute. And if not, we're gonna go to my favorite part of the meeting, which is almost like doula speed dating. So if we are gonna break out into breakout rooms. So um, those of you who are joining us, um, who are um, attending the workshop, who are not team members, you're gonna go into a, a breakout room and you'll have the ability to chat with uh, one or two of our doulas. Um, and then you can also swap um, after a little bit of time too. So doulas, when you're wrapping up, probably after about five or 10 minutes or so, you can leave and someone else can go in and we can kind of um, get to know each other a little bit that way. Uh, so I'm going to um, send everybody to the breakout rooms. There's going to be um, a note at the bottom that's going to say join. And please, um, please go ahead into those rooms. Our doulas are looking forward to meeting you. <laughs>